Inheritance of Hope presents Parenting Your Special Needs Child, featuring April Thompson and Gina Rose. My name is Gina Rose, and I am on staff with Inheritance of Hope. And today I am here with April Thompson, who has been a friend of Inheritance of Hope for quite a long time. Um, Tell me, April, tell me again, how did you connect with Inheritance of Hope? Yeah, so I came to know about Inheritance of Hope through Meg Hill. Um, She and I had a mutual person that we knew, and I was getting ready to graduate, and she had told me about Inheritance of Hope. She knew about my background um, in counseling and a little bit about my personal story um, and thought that I would really love Inheritance of Hope, and she was right. So, yeah, I think my first retreat was May of 2017, um, so definitely part of the family for sure. So you also work with special needs, is that right? I do, yes. So I work with kids who are um, emotionally dysregulated and sensory dysregulated. Um, I spend a lot of time working with parents, helping them understand what's going on when kids are dysregulated, um, either emotionally and or from a sensory perspective, um, and give them tools and resources on how to help their kiddo stay within that window of tolerance. And I'm sure that's something we'll hit later on. All right, April, let's talk about for a second, who would benefit most from this information that you're sharing with us? Yeah, I think that's a great thing to consider as we continue discussing this topic. The first group of people that would benefit from this information are families who have kids with special needs. Second group of people who would benefit from this information is any child who has a parent who has been diagnosed um, or who is walking through the journey um, related to, to diagnosis and or loss. The third group of people who would benefit from this information um, is any family who is experiencing a diagnosis and also has a special needs child. And finally, the another group of people who would benefit from this information is any parent with a diagnosis and are coping with this new transition in life, specifically as you parent your, ch- your neurotypical child or a child with special needs. So I, I really am a big proponent of we cannot identify this in others before we can identify it in ourselves. That's why it's so important to study this and apply it to ourselves and experience it for ourselves so that when we sort of master it or get used to it from our own perspective, we can start identifying it very easily and maybe even automatically with the children um, in our family. I think also it's, it kind of runs the same thought pattern of you've got to put your oxygen mask on first before you put your child's op- oxygen mask on. Um, so I think it's, it's, that's why it's important to learn how to regulate yourself, to get to know yourself and what makes you tick. Um, we're going to go through some things shortly on ways that you can regulate your mind and your body. Um, so that you can cope with the things life is throwing at you. Um, and then to also teach that to your children. Yeah. I would imagine that that is probably the biggest takeaway for people who come to see you is that this is a, it helps the adult know how to like own their own stuff in order to help a child do the same. Absolutely. In fact, when I work with parents, they walk away from counseling saying the most important thing, the most life-changing thing that we've learned is how to regulate ourselves so that we can regulate the kids in our household. So I have a couple questions. I wanted to find a couple terms for us. Um, The first one is, what does it mean that your child is dysregulated? I want to make sure that's really clear. What does dysregulated mean? Dysregulated means anytime that, so if we're looking at the hand brain, it's when they become unhinged. So if we're It's typically, I call it sensory dysregulated, which unpacking that term means when our our systems, sensory system is overloaded or we're not getting enough sensory input, that hinge tends to start flapping a little bit. Um, And so what this looks like is if you ever have those moments where you're kind of like, 
what is happening. And the kid is in the floor screaming or jumping on the couch, throwing things across the room and they're angry. Typically that means that your kiddo is dysregulated emotionally and or sensorily. Yeah, so it's like this reaction does not match the situation. Right. Um. So yeah, April, if you could kind of let us know um, what, what are we going to talk about today? Can you kind of set that up for us? Yeah. So today we're going to talk about really getting to the bottom of understanding a child's brain. Um, there's a model that I use in practice that Dan Siegel came up with. It's called the hand brain. Um, and so we're going to run through some graphics to understand structures of the brain in a fun way. Uh, we're also going to just clarify some clinical terms such as sensory dysregulation or sensory regulation, emotional regulation. Um, there's a term that I like to use um, that is the flipping of the lid. So when we get to talk about the hand brain, you'll see that the hand model of the brain, your lid flips. Um, we're also going to talk about uh, signs and behaviors that you can identify when your kid is dysregulated. Um, and then I'm going to give you a helpful goal that we want to keep those kids in the middle, like kind of boundaries for the kiddos to stay in the middle of. The most helpful tool I have found when explaining to parents how we can best understand our kiddos is something called the hand brain. So Dan Siegel introduced this to us a few years ago, and it's just kind of a, a fun way that we can understand the parts of the brain. So if we kind of think of the brain as a puzzle, there are different pieces that go to it. So I'm going to show you how to do it and you can do it with me. So as I explain, you can just kind of see on your own hand how these pieces kind of flow together so we can understand what's going on in a child's brain when they are dysregulated. So if you want to hop in and join me, I'm going to hold my hand up like a high five. I'm going to pull my thumb in. I'm going to close my fingers over them. So how, how it is right now, it's, it's just like I'm looking straight at you. This is my forehead. If I turn to the side, it's like this. And then you have the spine that runs down from the neck. So when we have the closed lid, we look at the front part of the brain. It's called the prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex is sort of that emotional filter. It's not fully developed until we're 25 years old, typically. Um, and it's that part of the brain that has to do with our thinking and our reasoning. It's also the place where we can orchestrate our thoughts and our actions and pair those thoughts and actions with goals. It's also the emotional regulation center of the brain. So if we look down here, sort of in the, the lower palm of the hand, we can, that represents our brainstem. Our brainstem is the house of automatic processes such as blinking, breathing, heart beating, digestion, those sorts of things. It's also the home of our primal instincts such as fight, flight, freeze responses. Down here, it represents our spinal cord which transmits signals throughout the body through, through the nervous system. So when we flip our lid, we can better see the parts of the cerebral cortex, which is the whole kind of squiggly part of our brain. So when we lift the lid, you can see the left and the right hemispheres. The left hemisphere houses language and verbal processing, logic, math abilities, black and white thinking, and then the right side motor skills. The right hemisphere houses the emotional and abstract reasoning, creative parts of our personality, the ability to intuitively reason, impulse control, and imagination. The thumb represents the limbic system. There are four parts of the limbic system that are important to know when understanding your children. The corpus callosum is the first. I'll put a picture up here so we can see what it looks like. The corpus callosum is the communication equator of the brain. It serves as the midline of the brain that bridges the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere together. So the object of the game is to have as much communication across the corpus callosum or the equator as possible to receive, to be functioning in a balanced brain. The second part we wanna focus on is called the hippocampus. This 
is the memory storage and spatial navigation center of the brain. This helps us receive information from the sensory motor cortex and helps us encode it into our brain so that we can have short-term and long-term memories. It's also helpful as we navigate when we walk, when we turn corners, um, when we sit down, when we stand up, those sorts of things. The next part is the amygdala. This is a very important part when, we, when it comes to understanding our children. It is located in the very center of the brain and it's the switching station of the brain. So if you think of a train station, when two trains come to a location, when, when a train comes to a place where it needs to go east or west, there's a switching station in that train track that helps point it in the correct direction. So the amygdala sends neurotransmitters up to the cerebral cortex so it sends it up to the cerebral cortex where we have our primary motor cortex and our sensory, sensory motor cortex and our right hemisphere and our left hemisphere remember those functions. So if the neurotransmitters are going north, then we have a regulated brain. But the amygdala also sends those neurotransmitters down. And if you remember, that's the brainstem where we have those automatic responses and primal instincts. So we fight, flight, or freeze. The fourth structure of the limbic system that is important to know is the olfactory bulb. The olfactory bulb is sort of a Q-tip-like structure that is located in the limbic system that is directly attached to the brain stem. So it is the only sensory mechanism that we have that's attached directly to the, to the brain stem. So fun fact, this is where essential oils or happy smells or things that you enjoy to smell calm you down because when you inhale it through your nose, it hits that olfactory bulb and it immediately closes the lid. It's kind of neat, I think. So when it comes to understanding our children, it's really helpful to understand what's going on in their brain. Are they dis being disobedient and misbehaving or is there something happening in the structure of their brain systems that's not online? So as we are talking through Dan Siegel's hand brain, it is important to understand that there's a big difference between a closed lid and a flipped lid. A closed lid, that limbic system is engaged with the top part of our brain. So we are able to reach those verbal skills and that emotional re uh, regulation responses if our lid is closed and everything is online. When that lid is flipped, the amygdala um, automatically shoots those neurotransmitters down to the flight, fight, flight, fight, freeze responses in our brain. The easiest way to help a child close their lid is to engage with their senses. So the sensory motor cortex is located sort of like a headband on the back part of the cerebral cortex. So it's sort of like my knuckles, how they serve as a hinge to open and close the brain that's what the sensory motor cortex does. So a great question to ask is, is my child's lid closed or is it flipped? And if it's flipped, what senses can I help them engage so that we can close that lid so we can go about our day? Okay, so I want to kind of try to get a grip here for myself on how do we tell the difference between when a child is like unhinging, as we've talked about, and when a child is just kind of misbehaving, um, just needs to be kind of disciplined or um, like, what's the difference between just the normal my child is acting out and my child is unhinging. How can we tell the difference? Yeah, I think the biggest thing to look for to determine whether or not they're unhinging or misbehaving, it's in their bodies. So if a kiddo is screaming or yelling or stomping, that's something they're doing with their bodies. And so we're going to talk about next time about sensory elements of behavior and you'll we'll, we'll get into that but I think the biggest thing is you see it in their body 
um, if a kiddo is misbehaving, it's kind of like they have their hand in the cookie jar and they're looking at you and you're saying, no, don't do that. And they grab the cookie and put it in their mouth as you're watching them and they just smile. You have to think about that they have a motivation, they have a strategy, um, they have a plan as to how they're going to uh, defy your rules or your principles in your household. Yeah, so I think of it, um, discipline is like making a very conscious choice to do inappropriate things. Um, and this is not that, this is like a, a physical reaction that shows up in like physical body behaviors yeah. and that, as an unhinging. Absolutely. And I think we can, I think misbehavior can come from the unhinging if we don't provide them space and understanding and validation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I spend a lot of times talking to parents about it's okay if your kid goes up to, this is nasty because it's germs, but I had a kid one time that mom and dad were saying that she would go up and to a trash can and like push it back and forth because she was getting her sensory regulation in and that's gross. So we probably shouldn't do that, but we can, ad we can adopt different behaviors to, to meet those same needs. Um, so I think in that moment, instead of saying, Oh, that's so disgusting. Why are you doing that? Ew. Backing off and saying, let's do this instead. Yeah. Giving them a different way, which we'll talk about later, right? The, be hinging or whatever we call that part. <laughs> okay, awesome. Lid. The closing of the lid. I like that better than the re hinging. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So here's a question. Um, you know, can can children become aware that they are kind of unhinging? Like, is that something that they can start to identify in themselves? Um, is that even possible? Or is this something that just adults in their lives have to constantly be on top of? Well, I think it's something that they can become aware of. And I think with parental guidance, it's possible. Um, so for example, when parents teach, teach their children sign language, a child needs to know that the word more goes with this hand signal right? And so as a parent helps them understand you're dysregulating or you're unhinging, there's this with the language that's involved of it's okay, you're dysregulated, let's do something that's different. And so that child is going to pick up of this motion of when they recognize their body is becoming dysregulated, whether from a sensory standpoint or an emotional standpoint, I would imagine that that's super helpful for children, especially if they have trouble with communicating, is to give them a way to express what's happening in their bodies then. Just a simple little sign. Absolutely. Right? It's not only helpful for them, it's helpful for the parents as well, because life happens around us, right? And so when we have a child that has been taught, I'm dysregulated, that's the sign for mom or dad to say, okay, let's go into our, our coping skills. Yeah, like a partnering then with your child. Exactly, team effort. Um, like overall, when we talk about what is the goal um, of what we're trying to accomplish, especially in the unhinging kind of thing, um, what would you say our goal is for children and maybe even us as adults when we are we come unhinged? What is the goal? Yeah, I would say the goal is quick and easy, bam. Balance, awareness, mindfulness. So we want to create balance in our bodies and in our emotional way of being. We want to, how we become balanced is we become aware and we acknowledge, okay, how does this feel in my body? How am I feeling right now, now that I'm feeling angry? Um, and then in those situations of, for example, being angry, we practice mindfulness of deep breathing and being present in the moment and not in the past and not in the future. So BAM, BAM is the goal. Be balanced, be aware, and be mindful. BAM. Bam. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> so as adults then, um, this isn't just about children. Um, yeah, this could be about, you know, me on a rough Tuesday, right? Um, getting cut off in traffic or whatever, like, um, how does this work in adults? Is it the same or is it different? 
I think it's the same. We're just, as adults, typically we're more aware of what, what we're feeling emotionally and physically because we have words to put to it, right? So when we teach them you're dysregulated, they know this and they're beginning to pull it into understanding what their body, what's going on in their bodies, but we're past that. We have words to describe my chest feels heavy, right? So I think it's for adults as well. And I think it's interesting too, because as little kids lid is flipping, mom or dad's lid could be flipping at the same time because kiddos lid is flipping. So it's kind of a, a tornado effect of kiddo is dysregulated. Therefore mom and dad may be also dysregulated because I mean, we're going throughout life and life is hard. So when we're balanced, aware, and mindful, we're able to help the child also become balanced, aware, and mindful. Last week that we do that through our senses. Right. Um, and so like, I'm assuming that's like the five senses. Would that be accurate? Well, there are five, but there's also three more that we don't really talk about very often. So the five that we know is sight, smell, taste, hear, and touch. Mm -hmm. But the three that we don't talk about, one is interoception, which is sort of that emotional awareness, sort of that unseen connection with the outside world. So are we perceiving how we perceive things, our intuition, those sorts of things. Another of the eight is called proprioception. So if you think about um, how some kids I've seen like to press themselves in doorways and climb on the door. So what they're doing is they're getting that pressure input from climbing. Um, and so anything that is producing kind of like a back push on them um, is, is going to give them proprioceptive sensory input. The last one is vestibular input. And that has to do with where we are in space. Um, so kids like to come in my office and I have a spinning chair and they just kind of like lay their stomachs down and just start spinning. So they're receiving that vestibular input as they're spinning around and around on the chair. So anything that has to do with um, either liking, like wanting more of that sensory input from a vestibular standpoint. So wanting to spin, or we even have some kids who don't like that feeling at all. So we'll kind of get into the difference between do kids like this? Is it helpful or do we need to kind of take it away so that they don't become overstimulated? So you just mentioned that there are some things that stimulate kids in good ways and maybe sometimes it's more overwhelming for them. Like, can you speak more to that? Sure. So for example, um, I was talking about the spinny chair in my office. So some kids come in and they're like immediately go to the spinny chair. I want to spin around as fast as they can. And kids who enjoy that and want that sensory input. So kids who vestibular input is what would help close their lid are going to be spinning and getting that sensory input. The total opposite could also be true. So there are some kids who come into my office and want nothing to do with the spinning chair. So if they were to get on that spinning chair and start spinning, their lid would actually flip. So for kids who do like spinning, it closes their lid. But for kids who don't like spinning, it actually opens their lid. So we really want to keep them in what's called that window of tolerance. So from the graphic that you can see, the green part is that happy medium place where they're regulated emotionally. Um, they can receive that information that, that you're trying to get them to understand. Um, and it's good for us as parents to also stay in our window of tolerance as well. So all of this sensory stuff is really helpful, not only for understanding our kids, but also understanding ourselves as we seek to parent our children. So if we are outside of on the low end, outside of our window of tolerance, we will experience sort of like low energy, we'll experience under functioning, sort of like a numbing of our emotions. And we aren't able to receive the information that's coming at us. So low tolerance or hypoarousal is when we're sort of like a bump on a log. Hyperarousal is 
easily the opposite. So there's lots of emotional re reactivity. There's a lot of increased sensitivity to sensory input. Um, high anxiety typically is something else you see with when somebody is overstimulated. Um, and there's sort of a, a disorganized kind of chaotic way of being when somebody is hyper aroused. Which makes sense that that's why we're talking about flipping a lid, right? Because it's it's obviously something is off balance. Right. Yeah, you can on. have too much of in both in both places. Either you can be over hyper aroused or you can be over hypo aroused. Gotcha. So you don't want to be a bump on the log, but you also don't want to be jumping on the couch, throwing pillows across the room either. Yeah. yeah. Right. And we want to find that happy. Yeah. That window like of tolerance. Yeah. That makes sense. Exactly. So when we're talking about this window of tolerance, if a child sort of misses that window one side or the other, either they're kind of escalating or really de-escalating, how do we discern the difference between then this is an obedience, like they're being disobedient, or this is a sensory issue? How would we determine that? I think the best way to determine that is to first observe what your child's preferences are outside of the chaotic situation. So a really great way to start getting to know them from a sensory perspective is to ask yourself, what do they like? What do they not like? So for example, when it comes to tactile or touch, the, touch sen the touch sense, does your child, is your child okay with tags in the back of their shirt? Are they totally unhinged because of the tag in their back in the back of their shirt do they ask to touch fluffy things do they ask to touch like spiky things um do your kiddos like to like certain smells and really really hate different smells um do they like some foods and not other foods um do they sit upside down on the couch without you telling them to? Are you asking Are you asking them to stop jumping on the couch or jumping off the stairs or that sort of thing? So I think once you get to know what they prefer from a sensory input standpoint, you can use that in the chaotic moment. So say they are jumping on the couch and they're being that you've asked them to stop and they're, they're being then being disobedient, but you recognize that they're also dysregulated. You can ask them, how about let's, let's go outside and maybe jump off the first step or let's go downstairs and jump as hard as we can. Um, or let's push, you know, push some heavy stuff across the floor, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So sort of like redirecting their outbursts. Yeah, instead of trying to, to diagnose it in the, the heat of the moment, it's like outside of those moments, see what works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do they enjoy? Yeah. So let's talk about each sense specifically. I'm going to give examples of what your child or you may look like as you are overstimulated or understimulated. Let's start with sound. So an example of being overstimulated from an auditory perspective is you may see your kids cover their ears like this. Um, you may see them leave the room inconspicuously, um, which may look like they really don't want to be a part of it and that they're being rude when in actuality they may be overstimulated by the noise that's happening in the room that they're in. An example of a child being overstimulated or you being overstimulated, understimulated, excuse me, about with auditory, from an auditory perspective would be if somebody dazes off or like daydreams. And then, you know, when we snap to get our kids attention, that's that auditory stimulation to get them back stimulated um, within that window of tolerance so that we can continue doing whatever it is we're doing with them. So some activities that we can use from an auditory perspective um, is to use headphones. Um, another example of this would be if a child is overstimulated, and we're seeing this more and more um, of having, having noise canceling headphones. Um, so if a kid is overstimulated, if you put those noise canceling headphones, they can be present in the room with you, um, but they're not overstimulated by the noise that's happening in the room. Another way to stimulate with noise is to sing songs. This is a fun way to get the family involved. You can sing your 
um, your favorite Disney songs, your favorite worship songs, your favorite um, nursery songs, whatever um, is appropriate for the age of your children. Singing songs can be really great for auditory stimulation. Finally, using white noise machines or other types of noise machines can be really helpful for auditory processing. Um, white noise is known to sort of calm the nervous system. Typically that's used um, when babies are sleeping. It's also really helpful for adults when they're sleeping. Um, and it's something that we use in the counseling office to drown out um, noise and keep it quiet in the room that we're in. So those are some examples of auditory stimulation. The next sense we're gonna talk about is visual. So if a child is overstimulated visually, um, they may cover their eyes if there's lots of lights. So for example, I think of police lights, um, The when they have somebody pulled over and it's nighttime and you're going down the road, those lights are really, really bright and that's for good reason. And that can be overstimulating to you or to your child. Um, so you can kind of make it a game when you're going down the road and your child is overstimulated by those lights. You can say, okay, one, two, three, cover your eyes and they'll do it and it kind of saves them, kind of saves their energy in their nervous system so that they're not overstimulated visually because as we have learned, when a child is overstimulated, that lid flips and it may be um, chaotic once you get home or in the car. Um, so an example of being understimulated visually is um, when a kid really loves to like stare at those lights, um, they, are, they can't get enough of it is sort of a sign that your child may be understimulated from a visual perspective. So for example, here are some practical ways to stimulate a child or yourself visually. Um, to stimulate, to avoid overstimulation, you can limit the exposure to light. So that's that cover your eyes activity that you can do in the car. Um, I think it's always fun to like make this into a game, especially for little kids. Um, another way to limit overstimulation visually is to create visually less chaotic environments. So for example, if there is a lot of clutter, um, a lot of piles of things, and granted, I know that life can be really hectic sometimes and piles are how we get by. Um, I think if we can neaten up those piles or make things you know, to use sort of a common term right now, minimalistic um, is really helpful for kids or adults who are over, overstimulated by lots of um, things in a room that's really helpful for them. Another kind of opposite end, so kids or adults who really love that visual input are sometimes calmed by bright flashing lights. So if you can find toys with flashing lights, um, you can do police cars, the fire trucks, or there, and I'll show you this sort of at the end as I um, introduce you to what a sensory basket looks like. There are balls that have flashing lights in them, um, and then they can be really helpful um, toys to use when kids are engaging and needing that visual stimulation. The next sense that we're going to discuss specifically is smell. Um, being overstimulated by smell is um, a good example of this is when those of us who have experienced pregnancy, when you have that heightened sense of smell, um, it's not pleasant um, and it kind of may give you this like, I need to flee the situation feeling um, or it may make you angry or um, it may make you feel unhinged when you smell a specific smell. Um, that's an example of overstimulation from a smell perspective. Understimulation is um, maybe picking up one candle. So maybe the, can the example of candles is if you're going into a candle store and there you are overwhelmed by the amount of smell that you smell, it can make you want to get out of that candle store. But if you regulate yourself and cause that hinge to close, you can stay in the store and then you can focus in on a specific candle that you really love um, and you just can't get enough of it. That would be an example of being understimulated and you just can't get enough of that smell of that candle. So some 
practical things you can use to simulate smell would be to either avoid or use preferred scents. Um, I use this example a lot when I'm talking about essential oils. There are some oils that you just don't like, and then there are oils that you really, really love. And so I think using your sense of smell to gravitate towards what you like and what you don't like is really is a really helpful to, tool. Another practical thing you can use with um, to simulate smell is to use either scented or uh, sand or scented dough. Um, that can hit a lot of other senses too, but if you're using sort of like a Play-Doh that has a lavender scent, and you like that, that's going to be a pleasant experience, and it's also going to calm the body. Um, and another sort of to reemphasize, you can use or avoid um, specific type of essential oils. That's a whole nother realm that we can, um, you'll, I would encourage you to do your own research, um, but specifically to ask um, a trained professional who uses essential oils um, for more information on that. But remember that your olfactory, your smell sense is the most um, connected sense to the bottom part of your brain. So if you remember the olfactory bulb is connected to the base of the brain. So anything we smell, um, it's going to stick with us. So for example, the smell of a hospital, I'm sure we can all remember what a hospital smells like. And typically those are not paired with the most pleasant memory sometimes, um, and sometimes they are. Um, so that's, that's sort of an example of how to be practical with the sense of smell. The next sense we're going to discuss is taste. So somebody who is overstimulated by taste may not like sour things or bitter things. These are sort of your super tasters. Um, they don't need a whole lot of flavor to get the gist of what it tastes like. Um, Understimulated tasters are really need more um, interaction with taste and with things in their mouth um, to really be satisfied from a sensory standpoint. Ways to be practical about this particular sense, um, there are things called chewable necklaces or chewing gum. Um, for older kids, there's sort of this um, piece of silicone that has a little bit of um, thickness to it. You just wear it around your neck and they can bite on it. Um, another really helpful tool in this category is vibrating uh, teething toys or even vibrating toothbrushes. Um, I had a parent come in one time and was explaining to me that their child really, really loved to bite onto the toothbrush when it was vibrating in their mouth. And I said, hmm, I think they're a little understimulated from their gustatory sense. Um, and so she ended up getting a more helpful tool, like a chewable necklace that has a vibrating mechanism in it so that the child didn't destroy their toothbrush. So I think that's a really helpful um, way to be practical as well. Another thing, um, another way to be practical with when it comes to taste is and you can even use this sort of as a gauge of what are your sensory preferences. Some people really love drinking through a straw. Some people really hate drinking through a straw. Um, so I think that's that's been a really interesting thing um, to observe as I get to know myself and as I get to know friends and clients is what's your preference? And I think that it's a it's a neat way to, to get to know each other in a different way. All of these are not just taste. Um, Another thing to become to use to be practical when it comes to the taste sense is blowing bubbles um, or creating games where you can blow things across the floor. So taking ping pong balls um, and creating a race um, that teaches deep breathing, which is great for your nervous system and for your whole body. Um, same thing with blowing bubbles. You're going to take a deep breath in and then blow that bubble out and you can um, turn that into a game as well. So the next sense we're going to talk about is touch. For a child to be, an example of a child being overstimulated by touch would be that they do not like the tag, the feeling of the tag in the back of their shirt or in their clothes. They don't like the feeling of socks. It's too much touch on their skin. An example of understimulation would be 
um, not getting enough, like not rubbing a, a, a soft fabric enough. So for example, I have bins in my, in the playroom at my office and they're sort of like a cottony like velvet feeling. And I have some kids who come in that just cannot get enough of like rubbing the outside of that bin. So that shows me that they are under stimulated when it comes to touch. So how do we get practical when it comes to the sense of touch? Um, a really great way is sensory bins filled with rice, lentils, beans, water beads. Um, so they can just simply stick their hands in and have a good old time. That would be a good example for understimulated children. Um, so you're getting that stimulation from them in that sensory bin. Um, another medium to use, other mediums to use would be kinetic sand, Play-Doh, thinking putty, those sorts of things. This would be an example of what we talked about with smell. Using that scented dough or that scented sand, you can implement those two um, senses together. Another really great way to be practical when it comes to the sense of touch is using a weighted blanket or stuffed animals, um, specifically stuffed animals that have fabric on them that are that fit within the preference of your child. And so that's another that's another reason why it's super important to really get to know what your child prefers from a sensory standpoint. So the next the next three we're going to talk about are those three senses that we are new to proprioceptive, vestibular, and interoception. Right. So the next sense we're going to talk about is proprioception. An example of a child or an adult being overstimulated by proprioception are those kids who say, oh, don't hug me. I don't want to hug. I don't like hugs. Understimulation would, uh, an example of understimulation from a proprioceptive perspective would be if you gave a kid a sensory sock, they just have a field day in it. They can't get enough of it. They want that input. Another example of understimulation are those kids who climb up the door frames like spider monkeys. Um, those are the kids who really want and need proprioceptive input. Examples uh, are ways you can become practical with proprioception. Um, the use of a sensory sock is really great. Um, that kind of sounds funny. And you can look them up on Amazon. Um, they are sort of these spandex like pillowcases for our bodies and you get inside of it and you have room to push out, but only the room um, that is fit for the height of you or your child. Um, another example of proprioceptive sensory input that can you can do at home is something called heavy work. This is a term that occupational therapists use on a regular basis um, when it comes to sensory integration. Um, Heavy work, an example of that would be pushing or pulling heavy boxes across the floor, doing push-ups, um, and for our older kids, weightlifting, um, those sorts of things. Another example of proprioceptive sensory input at home could be jumping on a trampoline or engaging in the practice of yoga, which is just stretching your mus muscles. Um, a great way to remember what proprioception is um, is to stretch our muscles, to put pressure um, on something using our muscles. So that, those are ways to be practical with when it comes to proprioception. Next to last, the sense we're going to discuss now is vestibular input. Um, when a child is overstimulated from a vestibular perspective, they do not like moving anywhere. It's sometimes even hard for them to walk. Um, I have a spinny chair in my office that I use to sort of gauge. I invite new kids to sit on the, the spinny chair and the ones who get really excited um, about spinning are understimulated and those are who kind of walk by and say no thank you are the ones who I know are typically overstimulated from a vestibular um, perspective. So some examples of sensory input that you can use to engage your vestibular senses are swinging, jumping, spinning, hanging upside down, sw um, swimming, and 
using a wiggle seat. So let's pop back up to hanging upside down. The reason why this is so helpful um, is because when you turn upside down, the blood rushes to your head, but it gets to the brain stem first. So when that brain stem is engaged, that's when the hinge go goes down. It's been really interesting as I've learned about the senses and how to engage people from a sensory perspective. I've implemented in my counseling specifically with teenagers um, and teenagers don't like to come to counseling, but I engage them with games and sensory toys and that are appropriate for their age, but I also invite them to sit upside down on my couch. And they kind of give me that funny look of this chick is crazy. <laughs> um, but I en encourage them to do it. And sometimes I do it with them where they put their feet above their head um, and get that blood rushing to the bottom of their brainstem. And you won't believe the conversations that come out of talking to them upside down. So um, that's a really helpful tool to really to get kids the hinges to come down um, when you know that they need to really talk about something. Um, granted, don't press them, but that can be a fun way to invite them into a conversation. Um, they definitely won't be expecting it, I assure you. So the last sense we're going to discuss is interoception. Interoception is a little bit different when we come to the topic of overstimulation versus understimulation. So let's use the example of emotional awareness in regards to inter interoception. So as a reminder, interoception is sort of that internal feeling that we have, um, which is related to our emotional awareness. So using that example, when someone is overstimulated emotionally from their interoception, they typically shut down emotionally. There, it's too much, it's too much stimulation for them to talk about or to express their feelings and their thoughts and their emotions. So the opposite is true for understimulated. Those of us who are understimulated, um, who may have a, an extremely high sense of emotional awareness, cannot get enough of talking about uh, our feelings or our emotions. Um, so it's really helpful um, to identify that within ourselves. You can ask yourself the question, do I, do I kind of freeze up when I go to talk about or express my emotions or do I talk about my feelings um, a lot? Um, so I think that's a good way to gauge how to get, how to get practical at home when it comes to our sense of interoception. Um, you can use warm baths, drink warm tea. Um, if you're not a warm tea drinker, perhaps an ice cold drink would be helpful. Um, it's typically going to be one or the other. You either prefer warm or you prefer cold. Um, another way that you can get practical with your children specifically, you can help them and introduce the language of this is too hot or this is too cold. This is this shirt is too loose or it's too tight. This is it. You can ask them, is it too soft or is it too hard? Sort of along those lines. So. So that was a lot of information and it can feel overstimulating, but it can be a really fun way to engage with your family. So for example, and so for example, I have a sensory basket with me. I have one of these that I keep in my office and sometimes at home because we all need a sensory basket, I think. Um, I have an example of a sensory basket and I just want to sort of walk you through what I have in my basket and what senses it stimulates. So let's start with this fun thing. It kind of looks like a bottle of water that has food coloring in it, which seems kind of odd, but I can shake it up and I start kind of seeing the water beads that are in the middle of this. And you can kind of see the contrast a little bit in your screen. This is a really cool way for kids who really like visual stimulation um, you can say here, find the water beads and they're going to focus in on, oh, okay, I see them now. 
Um, another way that I use visual stimulation specifically that has water and something inside of it is I shake it up and explain like you're feeling like this right now and it's swirling all over. But if we can take some big deep breaths, our body calms down more and more. So that's an example of one thing that I have in my sensory basket. Another thing is this pop it, I call it bubble, bubble wrap, like permanent bubble wrap. These are really popular right now. Um, I have a cousin who just asked for one of these for his birthday and I was like, you can have as many as you want. Um, so these are just like, it gives you that sensation of popping bubble wrap. Um, and a cool trick, if you pop them all out on one side, you can't really see it, there we go. And you run your finger down, you pop them all at the same time. This one's new, so it's not quite working as well as the other ones do. It's just super satisfying. This is good for auditory stimulation, um, for tactile or touch. Um, it's a very soft. Some kids may also not like the feeling of this. Um, I'm a little, I'm not super crazy about it now that I'm feeling it. I'm not super crazy about it, um, but it also sort of feels nice. And I really like the the pop the the bubbles in it. Now that I'm also doing it, I recognize I'm engaging in proprioceptive input. So there's just this very minor like push that I'm using with um, my fine motor skills. So that's another really good one to have on hand. Um, another is um, crazy earrings thinking putty. This is they also have like smaller tubes. I couldn't find those um, this go, but this is another really great one and you can take all of it or you can share um, give one kid half or a third and give the other two another third um, this is visually stimulating um, this one in particular is like blue and purple and it has glitter in it so fun visually it's also tactile so it's more of that slime feeling um, some kids may not like that other kids are like give me all the slime you can. Um, and this is also proprioceptive. So you're pulling. Um, so that's a, that's a good example for, I think three different senses. And the last thing that I have in my bucket or in the sensory basket are these fun spiky balls. So these are really good for tactile stimulation. This is for somebody who is understimulated um, to calm down and refocus. Um, it's also squishy, so it can be a little bit of a stress, proprioceptive stress relief. It's also visual. This may be overstimulating. It may be exactly what a child wants. Um, also use this the same way I use the water bottle with, you're feeling like this right now, but if you take deep breaths and use those tools that we've learned in other spaces, um, it's really helpful to calm the body. So have fun, get your kids and take them to Target or to Walmart or even the dollar store. Um, I find the best sensory toys at Dollar Tree or Dollar General or whatever dollar store is near you. Um, so make it a fun adventure um, and have fun with the family. Okay, so we kind of want to like wrap some of this up with um, what do you do if your child needs more help? I mean, in other words, you're noticing that your child's issues are less behavioral and probably more in the range of what we're talking about as special needs. Um, and you're, you're just noticing stuff going on. Like, how do you know where to get help for that? Where do you even start? Yeah, that's a really great question. I think the best place to start is with your or your child's primary care physician. So the person that you go to when you have a sinus infection or um, an ear infection, those sorts of things. I think the best place to start is there and they can direct you for with what resources are available in your area. In a kind of perfect one fell swoop situation, I think you start with your primary care, they lead you to a play therapist and then that play therapist is going to be able to assess your child and their specific needs and then give you even more information on if there is a next step and if 
and what step that is. So they may refer you to a pediatric psychologist and or a neuropsychologist, um, as well as for an occupational therapy um, assessment focusing on sensory integration. Yeah, so I love that, like you start with somebody you already know, like your primary care person um, or your child's pediatrician um, somebody that you already have a connection with. It may, I would imagine even if you don't have a primary care or your child doesn't, even starting with your oncologist social worker, that typically somebody that knows the resources in your area would be Absolutely. really helpful. Mm -hmm. Even if it's a, a pastor at your church or um, the, like you said, the social worker that's on the case with your oncologist, mm -hmm. if it's a friend, um, and you might have to look outside of your area just a tad, or maybe a lot. Um, just somebody that you can connect with that can help you find out what resources you have available to you. So um, it would be important then, I would think, to remember that you might not get all the, the services that you need the first time you try. Like it might take some effort to kind of work through finding the right team to help you. Yeah, I think more often than not, it's gonna take more than one shot. You know, I think when it comes to, for example, medication, it's not always right with the first trial. Um, so we have to try again. Um, so you may reach out to your primary and they say, I don't know, reach out to this person who's, um, a psychologist in the area and then it may that it may be that you land with them and that's a really good fit and you're able to continue forward or that psychologist may connect you with the play therapist um so yeah definitely be open to the process being difficult unfortunately yeah, yeah and i think it's important to recognize too that when you are creating that team of people that's going to love and support your child um that it would be important to think of yourself as kind of the captain of that team. In other words, I think it's easy for us to feel like, oh, you're a professional, just fix them. Yes. Um, and instead it, it would be important to take on the role of like, I'm getting you to support me and what I'm doing. Would that be accurate? I think that's a really great way to put it. I often tell the parents that I work with is I'm a part of your village. Um, and you have boots on the ground where I can't. So I can't, unfortunately, I can't go home, go home with you guys, nor can I fix anything and everything. It's so important for parents to understand and to take leadership and authority in the, in the process of helping themselves and helping their children. Um, so I, I really love having a team mindset. Uh, I really love when I, I really love working with parents who have a team mindset. Um, so I think that's absolutely important. Well, we're going to end this amazing time together um, with a quote, because I think it's appropriate here, uh, from one of my favorite authors. Her name is Madeline Lingle. Um, and she says that until I have worked through self, I will not be enabled to get out of the way. Um, and I love that idea that I need to work on me in order to be able to fully give myself to someone else to really help someone else. And as I apply that to this idea of thriving, because I do believe that special needs families can thrive even with a diagnosis. I think what we're offering um, children in this is a regulated self working through myself so that I can really pour into them and help them understand themselves. Um, and that is really a takeaway for me from this, as I've listened to what you're, you're teaching us, um, April, what would you say to what I'm saying? I think that is a beautiful way to encapsulate what we've talked about. I think everything we've learned is the how to that quote. Mm -hmm. The question is, how do we do that? You get to know yourself from a sensory and emotional perspective, know what you prefer, know what you need and learn the needs of those around you so it's it's a full systemic experience you're you're changing your environment when you change yourself mm -hmm. um so yeah i think that's a beautiful way to 
to think about this topic. And what a powerful legacy, right? To leave um, your special needs child is the ability to thrive, even if you're not there anymore. I mean, yeah. that is a an amazing legacy to offer them. I was just going to say, and it's so doable. It's possible. Yeah. Even yeah. when it feels like it's not attainable, I really hope that these tools and these resources help you guys know that you can, you can help yourself and your children thrive during this time. Hmm. April, I can't even begin to thank you enough for your expertise, for your time. I mean, this has been a big chunk of your time to help us put this together and you have just graciously offered it to us. Um, you are such a good friend of Inheritance of Hope and I'm just really, really honored to be part of this with you. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity and it's such a pleasure.